go ahead and let everybody in and then get this going once we have everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ariel Rivers, NACD's Pacific Region Representative, and I will facilitate this one hour NACD Urban and Community Conservation Webinar. Thank you for joining us to learn about West Virginia Conservation Agency's mobile soil trailer. We will record this webinar and post it on NACD's website along with a PDF of the presentation for future access. Please share widely with your networks and anyone who may be interested in seeing this or previous presentations. Please keep yourself muted for the duration of today's call. After the presentations, we will have a question and answer session. Please type your questions in the chat box and the facilitator will read them for the recording. We'll address as many as we can. Now, Ron Rohall will provide a few introductory comments. Ron is Vice Chair of NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, which is part of our Natural Resources Policy Committee. Ron? Hey, thank you, Ariel, and uh, good morning, everybody, and I welcome all of you to the monthly Urban and Community Conservation Webinars offered by the National Association of Conservation Districts through the support of our sole sponsor, the Scott's Miracle Grow Company. These sessions are designed by NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, a subcommittee of district officials and partners charged with guiding the association's services and support for districts' work in, developed, in developing areas. Our goal through these webinars is to help districts share what they are doing nationwide and enable them to learn from each other and various agencies and organizations. And we appreciate the support of the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation for making them possible. I invite you to let us know what you think about each of our webinars and what other topics you would like us to cover by contacting NACD staff at Ariel Rivers. And please tell our NACD leadership what type of assistance you would like from your national association for your urban and community conservation work. And now I'll hand it over to Ariel for the introduction of this afternoon's speaker. So this Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Today we have one speaker from the West Virginia Conservation Agency. Amy Figgett is an energetic individual that accepts tasks with extreme passion, which we will definitely see today in this presentation. With a creative mind, Amy has been successfully providing education to the public in an unordinary fashion for numerous years. Thank you for your presentation today, Amy. And with that, I'll hand it over to you to get going. Thank you, Ariel, so much. And hi, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, the Soil Trailer is a passion of mine. It's my baby. And so I'm really excited to tell folks about it. And in the past, we've actually been able to help other states create their own soil trailers to have for educational purposes. So I'm hoping that maybe some of you will be inspired just like I was by the Kansas um, Miami County Conservation District. And maybe you can get your own soil trailer built and I'll be happy to help you. So um, again, my name is Amy Figgett and I'm the Education and Outreach Specialist with the West Virginia Conservation Agency. And if I get too fast or too slow, flag us, let Ariel know, and we'll slow it down. Um, so we're going to start with where I got my inspiration for the soil tunnel trailer, and that was the Kansas soil tunnel trailer. I attended the NACD conference in 2012, and the folks were there from Miami County, Kansas, and they were showing a slide, um, a presentation on their um, Kansas soil tunnel trailer. And from that moment on, I knew I had to have one. I called home and I told my friend Cindy Martell, who worked at the West Virginia Department of Agriculture at that time, I said, we have to have one of these in our in our state, we have to. And so they all got on board and somehow we made it happen. Um, Miami County Conservation District was so gracious. They shared so much information about their project with me and they had a professional artist that was able to build theirs. But unfortunately for me, we didn't have that here. And so it was kind of on me. Um, ADA accessibility was important in their design and it was a priority for ours. The difference between theirs and ours is that we live in West Virginia and our roads are terrible and we live in the mountains and everything is a switchback, a curve, a turn and a mountain mile. So we needed to make sure that our trailer was flexible with flexible materials that could withstand that transportation. 
So my first sketches were a little rough. You probably can't tell by this, but I am an artist and have been for the majority of my life. But sometimes when you're just trying to convince folks to get on board with your crazy ideas, you just have to give them something for a visual. So I tapped these out real quick, presented them to the board of supervisors that was at my district where I was at the time a supervisor as well. And they climbed on board and somehow I convinced them that this was a good idea, even though I had no idea what I was doing. So to get the soil trailer started, we needed some grants and some funding. And thankfully for Cindy Martell, I was able to receive a $10,800 USDA specialty crop block grant, which was administered by the West Virginia Department of Agriculture. Cindy helped me understand the grant process, how it worked, and really coached me along the way. My district was able to back me with the purchase of a trailer, which was $8,238. And then two years into the project, we were able to get another 3000 from the Department of Environmental Protection here in West Virginia for a litter control grant, and then 2000 from the West Virginia American Water Company environmental grant. And then our conservation district agency, um, the executive director, Brian Farkas, said, hey, if you finish this project, I will support you and I'll pay for your wrap. So I hurried up and got it done as fast as I can. And I expected $5,000 for wrap, but instead he decided to give me 20,000 for program maintenance, which was amazing. So when the trailer came, I was a little overwhelmed. I wasn't sure what to do because it was just plywood and I was unsure of everything. Um, it was very daunting. I know very little about actual construction, so I had to very quickly um, educate myself on materials, the components of materials, adhesives, chemical hardeners, foams, what kind of paint to use on foams, how to be able to paint on foam, because if you've ever painted on foam, you know that paint causes foam to melt. So as an artist, I had a visual for the end result but I had absolutely no idea how to get there. And this project consumed so many of my days and I had so much to learn, but I just really wanted to get to the end goal. So we got started. Um, we tried a couple different types of foam first. In the upper right-hand side, you'll see that there's a yellowish foam and that's balsa foam. For any of you who decide to build a soil trailer, do not purchase balsa foam. It will lie to you. That, that foam is the least forgiving, most dust causing, is sculpting foam for fine sculpting, for art. Um, that was a huge mistake. It was extremely heavy. Each panel weighed almost 200 pounds and it, it was just terrible. So we ended up ordering five pound, five inch expanded polystyrene foam from a roofing company. And it was fairly inexpensive for the amount of foam that we needed was only around $1,200. Hot tools are what we use to carve into foam. And if you can possibly imagine using a hot tool or hot wire, it's like carving with fishing line. So it's like using monofilament to actually carve into things, but it's hot. So it's not easy. And it, it, was, um, it was a lot more difficult than what I expected. But thankfully, I had some help. So introducing my little brother, Henry, there in the um, bunny rabbit ghostbuster suit. He was able to step in and really pick up helping me. Um, he's a professional carpenter and his friends were professional carpenters. And as I was struggling to get through the project, they really stepped in and helped me out a lot. I was able to do the foam carving. I was able to get things put together, but they were really able to come in and teach me how to get these put together better and much more stable. So I do want you to look at the largest picture in the top center, and you'll see that there's an opening between the foam. Here in West Virginia, where we do have such mountainous roads and so much movement, we really had to think of how we were going to let things shift. So if we think of the earth and how the plates shift, that's the same basis that we we went with. So we put um, kind of like the cartilage between bones, um, we put foam like foam strips, weather strips that were um, easy to expand in between those joints of that foam so that as we move around, it could actually shift so that it didn't crack. I thought I was an absolute genius for coming up with that. And I didn't realize that, you know, until my brother said, oh, like the tectonic plates on the earth are like, you know, the cartilages and bones. And, so, and I was like, oh, well, I thought that I came up with that myself, but apparently... You know, it's been around since the 
beginning of man. Um, with their help, we were really able to pull it off. But something I do want to put out there is when you use foam hardener, the best foam hardener that I have found, and I'm not touting any product, but this is what worked for us was Styro Spray 1000. We had to order it from Texas. I do not recommend doing it yourself. Um, I would find a professional paint shop to do it because it was messy. It was very difficult and it had a really harsh odor. So here we are once we're primed and we have the styro spray on it and it looks very sterile, but then we were ready to start painting and we was me because my brother does not like to paint. So I started with the first layer and we had to go six more layers. And here we are throughout some of the layers of the paint. Um, we had to do the base coat, then we had to do the tint coat, then we had to do a texture coat, then we had to do the overcoat, and then the detail coat. It's not something that everyone would have to do. It's just how I paint as an artist, but a lot of folks have opted to have theirs airbrushed by an airbrush artist, which I would say is a great idea. Um, and this was fun because this was the part of the work that I really enjoyed. So here we are when we're getting the finish work done. Um, as the project went by, it did still continue to consume a lot of my time. And I was learning as I went along, um, right around the time that the soil trailer was built, my son was in high school and I no longer existed in his world because he was into, you know, all of his high school life. So I had time and I poured it into this project. This part was the easiest for me because basically I was getting to decorate and add the finishing touches. Um, and you'll notice that it is very 3D, very tactile. Everything sticks out. Some of it sticks out a little too far. Um, that poor little duck that floats in the air for some reason, the kids love to jump up and hit it. And I have no idea how it survived to this day, but it has. The turtle in the middle, oftentimes men will hit their heads on it, even though it's um, six feet in the air, they can't see it to duck. So they end up walking right into it. But somehow he's managed to stay stable, can, even through all of that. So something that was important, of course, is to have your soil microbes. So we went with 3D printed soil microbes because that way I can take them out and change them out as I wish. And it's also a more tactile um, learning tool for students who may have low vision or be blind. So when they enter the soil trailer, we can actually give them the 3D printed microbe to hold, touch, and feel. And when we're out in the field, if we know that we have students that are visually impaired or if we're at the school for the blind or a classroom for the blind, we'll actually 3D print microbes for each child to take home. We have a 3D printer for the program. So there's even times that if I'm at a school that has pre-K through 12th grade, I'll take the 3D printer with me because honestly, anybody past seventh grade are not entirely interested in the trailer Instead, they're interested in how it was built. So we'll focus on how we built it, how we use it for education, and then I'll let them all 3D print something because for them, that's fun. Um, I made two inch wood um, trays for the flowers that go on top of the trailer. But when we get strong winds and the flowers are tall, it will flip them over. So I put them kind of towards the center of the trailer so they don't fall on people's heads. Uh, next time I will build aluminum trays that will actually snap into place on the roof. It weighs a lot less because lifting those 60 pound trays or flower um, wood planks over my head is a little more difficult as I've gotten older, but um, that way it'll be secure. And that's the most important thing. And we do put artificial flowers on top. And I just want to say that there's been a lot of folks who have asked me how we keep the flowers from blowing off when we're going down the road. And I have to explain to them that we actually take the trays off and put them inside the trailer when we're transporting. And then I've had folks ask me who does the watering. And I've explained to them that the, the flowers are actually fake. So we'll move on to the cutest little things about the soil trailer and that is our clientele. Our West Virginia Conservation Agency communication specialist was our photographer for the soil trailer exterior wrap. And um, I think he did an amazing job. And these kids were wonderful models. They 
they really worked hard. I know it doesn't seem like it's hard work to get your picture taken, but it was a lot of hard work for a lot of these kids because we were at a park and there were squirrels and there were ducks and there was a playground and they had to really focus on what they were doing and not chase squirrels. So it was um, it was less than easy for them. So I give them big props. And here we are our finished product, the soil tunnel trailer. You can see on the top, um, not so well with that tree background, but you can see the flowers on the top and we even have a small beehive on the backside. Um, we have the ramps going in and going out. And the only thing that I would change that's in this picture is I like to have a small picket fence in front of that hitch because people do tend to walk into it. And when I say people, I mean me a lot. Um, you'll notice the guide wires, the, um, the ramp wires. We do cover those just like the Miami County um, soil trailer does. We do cover those with um, pull noodles. Children do walk into them and they will try to swing off of them. So number one, you can keep them from getting hurt. But number two, you can also with the pull noodles, if they try to swing, the pull noodle just moves with them so it won't swing them. So they actually will leave it alone then. So we're gonna go through a few interior photos. So this is the specialty crop wall. This has all of our produce. And when we explain to the kids when they come in is that you are in the garden. You're no longer a person, you're an earthworm. You might be a mole, you might be a groundhog. You could be anything that lives under the ground. And this is what your bedroom would look like if you lived under the ground. So imagine how cool that would be to actually live inside the garden. And so the kids really, really get excited about that. But this is the right side wall. And this is um, the back side is to the right and the front ramp is to the left. So here we are from the backside looking at the water wall, which is a very important part of our education outreach program. That is our clean water wall. So one side shows contaminated water, the other side shows clean water. And at the top, it does the same. And we have some debris and some litter floating around in there. And that helps us educate the students on what we should not see in our water versus what we should have in our water. And it gives them a little idea of what little things that, what little steps they can take to make big changes because kids often think I'm just a kid you know how am I supposed to make any changes but we assure them that they can make an impact no matter how small they are. So here's the other side we're looking from the back side onto the left wall the left left wall is filled with our insects our invertebrates uh, micro invertebrates there's a little bit of everything in there. Um, and it also shows the back wall as well. And you might notice there's the little turtle again in the roof and he is very much the showcase. When you come in, it's a she actually, and she's digging towards the back door. So when the students come in, they're actually facing that turtle. Um, we have a lot of varieties. And one thing that I would like to point out on the next slide is you'll notice that our microorganisms are in round circles with convex domes over them. The convex domes prevent students from reaching in and grabbing them and tearing them up. But more than that, it also gives the visual that they're looking into a microscope. By doing so, they can see that these these microbes are anywhere from 500 to 10,000 times larger or more than what they actually are. When we have students who are visually impaired, we take the domes off and we actually hand the students the microbe because students who are, are low vision or blind are very gentle with their hands because their hands are their eyes. We also take off these paper placards that you see here. We remove these and we add placards that have braille on them. We do not leave the braille in year round or for every visit because unfortunately students will rub it hard and they'll rub it off. So we only use those when we're visiting children who have low vision or blindness. So this is another version or another view. Um, you can see the little fish floating around and the pond. Um, it, we're gonna be making some changes to that this year while we're off from travel and um, probably right around where the Appalachian blue crayfish is. We're gonna actually turn that into a little more of a um, terrestrial area. And here's our famous guy, the turtle. Um, and the turtle's actually female, but we always refer to him as a guy anyway. Um, 
she's actually digging into the soil to lay her eggs because turtles don't live underground but they do dig into the soil to lay their eggs and that allows them to keep their eggs safe of course it keeps their eggs moist it keeps their eggs warm and cool all at the same time so we explained to the children then you know that that's that's why there's a turtle in the soil so our project took four years to complete. Um, unfortunately, it took all of those years because we had the first artist that we hired to work on it took two years with it and didn't do anything at all. And we did actually pay him a um, down payment, a, a contract fee. And so we lost that. And that was a lesson learned. But we did finally get it finished in, in August of 2016. It was a challenge. It was a lot of challenge. And it was a lot of work, but it was a one-off project. It was the first time we did it and it was a learn as you go. So I think it turned out pretty good considering and it's pretty stable and pretty sturdy. We visit anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 folks a year with the soil trailer and it's withstood about 50% of that are students. So we just have rules when they go in. This is Abigail. Abigail is 13 years old, and she's one of my favorite students that likes to visit the soil trailer. Abigail has plans on becoming a mechanical design engineer. When she grows up, she actually wants to design wheelchairs. Um, that wheelchair that she is in is extremely fast, and the skins on it, she likes to change the skins on it so that she can change colors just like other girls like to change hairdos. Um, She's a, an incredibly intelligent girl, and I can't wait to have her consult for me um, in the future. She's she's really great to help. So, but there are important qualities about the soil trailer that some of you may not think about, and it's something that's been very important to us. So we're just going to take a minute on the next screen. And now we're going to change to the next screen. So what do you see on these two slides? You can't really see anything. And without my voice, you, you have no idea what it is. But the first one was nothing. And this one is a blur. And it's, it, it strains your eyes to try to see it. So as programming educators, we really need to think outside of the box to accommodate our students. And for a child who is blind, a soil microbe can only be described to them. They cannot feel a real microbe. They, cannot, they, they can't touch a real microbe to learn. It's only described. And if you've never had vision, even the description is disordered to you. For a child who's visually challenged, it doesn't make sense and it may not make sense and it trying to see it can cause eye strain and for a lot of students that really results in very painful headaches for a child who's deaf or hard of hearing imagine being in an instructional time where children are hyper and moving around and there's arms up and and the teacher's moving around and they're turning their head and you're trying to watch what's going on but watch your interpreter at the same time so much is missed during that instructional time Less than 6% of blind, visually impaired, deaf, or hard of hearing students across the United States receive opportunities to learn about conservation and agriculture. And even less than that have any tactile learning tool or any instructional inclusiveness for this. And we need to do better. We all need to do better because our students deserve our best. Something I've been very grateful for is that the West Virginia Conservation Agency is dedicated to supporting the educational needs of all West Virginia children. We're very fortunate. Everyone in our agency across the board is willing to be all hands on deck to do this. It doesn't matter what their job is, they're all in. The Soil Trailer is an Americans with Disabilities Act accessible unit. It's designed specifically for blind or visually impaired individuals. All of the carvings within the trailer are outlined. So if a student is touching and feeling, they know where something begins and they know where it ends. 
We have the braille placards to utilize when the blind children are in attendance. Adults and children who utilize equipment such as wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, or other mobility devices, such as the um, little jazzy scooters, they have full accessibility to the soil trailer. We have ADA compliant ramps to enter and another to exit. Nobody is ever trapped inside of it and unable to get out. None of us like to be trapped behind a crowd in a corner. And oftentimes when you use a mobility device, that happens. So they can get in, they can get out. They're never trapped inside. They're never going to have to run over any toes to get in or out. And the floors are 100% created and painted with a very special paint so that children, even with cerebral palsy who may walk but drag their feet, they won't drag their feet and fall because it's designed specifically for them. When we were determining what floor we would have, we had several children who use crutches or drag their feet to come in and out of the trailer to make sure with different types of flooring that it would work. We couldn't have anything slick. We couldn't have it too textured. So we actually had a mix made so that it would work just perfect. Adults and children who are deaf. You can imagine if there's several people inside the soil trailer, they're going to have a difficult time seeing what's going on. Kids are running around. The interpreter gets blocked. The teachers are turning every which way when they're talking. But we don't have that issue in the soil trailer. We don't have a communication barrier because the presenter can present the programming in both spoken English and American Sign Language. So if I'm presenting in the soil trailer, I'm doing that speaking. And if I have a student in the soil trailer who's deaf, I'm signing at the same time. I'm blessed in the sense that I come from a family with deaf individuals, so I'm able to use sign language, but just like many deaf family members, I use home sign. So our agency has given me the opportunity to attend a master's program for the past four years so that I'm able to teach in American Sign Language. And so I've definitely improved in that and I'm able to do so now. I'm very grateful for that. But folks, this next slide is exactly where it's at. So this, this is it. Um, there's never a time that I come across this picture and I'm not speechless. This was my goal and this was my end result. And we were able to take this trailer on its maiden voyage to the West Virginia schools for the deaf and the blind. And one of the things that was the most wonderful when I got to the schools is that so many of my coworkers showed up from that region. I was five hours from home. I didn't really, I'd never met a lot of them before and they showed up and they showed up to support me. They showed up to support the unit. They showed up just to be there. Um, it just so happened on the same day, um, the entire Board of Education, the State Board of Education was there. So that was a little nerve wracking because they did have the advisory committee for the schools for the deaf and the blind. And that included several deaf and blind advisory members. So um, I got a crash course in making sure that I did everything right that day there are things I would do differently. I may do some things right, but there's a lot of things I did wrong in this project. Number one, I accepted delivery of that trailer before the ramp extensions were put on correctly. And that has been an issue since we've had it because trying to get it corrected was not gonna happen. So we finally had to give up. But the next time I would make sure that the specs are exactly as I needed before I accept delivery of the trailer. We did lose $2,500 to an artist who didn't do anything and kept the trailer for two years and did nothing to it. So I would from now on do legally binding contractor agreements. I would like to find a foam hardener with less odor, but the same durability. And I've been trying some different materials, but so far I've just not found anything with the same durability. So we're gonna keep looking at that. Something that I needed to do then, and I'm going to do this summer, is add handrails for folks who go up the ramp, even though it's only 12%, it is a little steep to others, and it's a little frightening for children who are blind, so I am adding handrails this year. And I would definitely add an awning before the interior construction begins. The really great thing is I'm going to have an opportunity to make these changes because soil trailer number two is on the way. We've been able to procure another 
specialty crop block grant to build a second larger trailer and boy do we need it um, i'm booked when we are booking i could be booked easily six to seven days a week from may all the way through november um, some teachers even want me to come in december and they're like hey the kids can wear coats and i'm like hey i'm out there seven hours a day i think not so um, the unit is in purchase now there's a manufacturing shortage so we're going to work on that but it's on the way uh, we do have a new building to build it in that was an exciting surprise for me i had no idea that was coming and the WVCA does continue to invest in the soil trailer education programming. You know, they they enjoy it. They like it. And we're very fortunate with that. And um, I'm going to breeze through now kind of quickly to try to close this up. Um, but this will be posted. Ariel said it will be posted and sent out on their site. So anybody that wants to review it certainly can. So we do have a contract and you're probably wondering, how is this paid for? Well, the soil trailer is a rental unit. And there are several ways that schools cover the rental fee or other events. Um, conservation districts in our state are our superheroes. They often lend support and they'll actually cover the fee or split the fee with the entities that want to rent it. There are grants, Title I funding, PTO, PTA, local businesses. Um, they oftentimes will help sponsor the soil trailer. And the WVCA employee, myself, will assist schools with procuring that financial aid. And we do have a scholarship form, which I've posted there. Watershed groups, we're working on writing that into our base grant so that we're able to give more watershed groups access to the soil trailer, since that's one of our large focuses. Um, all of the revenue from the soil trailer is put back into the soil trailer, every single penny. So just like everybody else, COVID-19 put a damper on our program, but we didn't let it get us down. We have spent the past year building new curriculum. We, our outreach program has done amazing. We were able to fit directly into virtual schooling, homeschooling, and all of the work from home needs of the families within West Virginia. And I need to give a big shout out to our WVCA IT team. They are amazing. We like to call them the Grand Wizards. They had us up and running within seven days of being sent home to work from home. Everybody within our agency had access to the best that they had to offer. And we're so grateful to them because it kept my program going. Um, another great thing, we have um, a workshop coming up. We're looking at June of 2022. Of course, we're gonna wait and see where we're at with COVID guidelines. But any of you that want to come and take a visit to the absolutely beautiful mountain state, June is a wonderful time to do so. And we'd like to welcome you with open arms. And we'll just keep touch for anybody who wants to come and learn more about how to build a soil trailer. And we'll actually do a build throughout the time. I think it's going to be about four days. So we'll actually work and learn how to build a soil trailer in those days. So I hope to see some of you there. So with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions um, that anyone may have. And I appreciate everyone again for coming and listening. And hopefully I didn't go too fast or too slow. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I have to say to our audience, when I had asked Amy for a uh, bio, she said that she asked one of her colleagues to write it. And that's how the uh, the term that Amy is an energetic individual ended up in there. But I will definitely say that uh, your colleague did not lie. Your passion truly shows through with this project. So thank you very much for sharing it with us. And that so same, asked, I'm sorry, that same colleague, I can see she's in this call. So. <laughs> Well, thank you to her. While we wait for uh, questions from the audience, um, I would like to ask if perhaps you could walk us through what the process is for a school or an event to uh, acquire the, the trailer uh, for their event. So what is the process for submitting the forms for the rental? And then uh, how do you get there? What is the setup like? How long is the instruction, et cetera? So when someone is interested, they just email me or call me, and then I'll send them the application form. Uh, we'll decide what their need is, if they're a school. Schools have other paperwork to fill out that lets me know how many teachers they have, how many classrooms they have, what the age levels are, um, what they have as far as 
primary or intermediate. And from there, we actually set a class schedule based on how many students we have. And then um, we'll actually plan our activities on the age level. So um, once they get that application and we have to find a date and something that comes as a surprise to many is that we book almost two years in advance. We're that busy. In the state, we have a few folks who are able to transport the trailer. Um, I normally transport the trailer, but we have another lady in the Eastern Panhandle that's able to transport the trailer. We have my, my colleague who wrote my bio who can transport the trailer, even though she's not a fan of doing so. And we have a coworker in her office named Ben who can and will if we ask him to a little bit begrudgingly, but he's actually really great to help us. So we're appreciative of him. Um, Otherwise, we don't have a whole lot of folks within our agency that can tow a trailer that size. Um, but some of us ladies, <laughs> we can. <laughs> so we, we do so. Um, we take it there. We have a um, fleet vehicles to tow it with. And we get it there. We set it up. It takes about 45 minutes to set up. We set up three outdoor classrooms. So if we have a classroom with 23 to 25 children, we split that into three to four groups and then the kids rotate through the different outdoor classrooms and the soil trailer simply because when you get 23 children in the soil trailer it's a little bit chaotic and it does end up making you do the presentation 36 times in a day but that's okay you know the kids get more instructional time and every single student that we visit gets to have a make and take project from one of the workstations so um but fairs festivals things like that are a little bit different we just kind of set up we have somebody watching inside we have somebody doing hands-on activities outside and um you know we just or work with others we work with our extension groups um sometimes district supervisors will come out and work with us and we can often find master gardeners that want to come out and help as well but as far as billing and things like that um we do have administrative support so i keep track of what needs to be billed i send that on to um, our fiscal department and then they send out the actual bills and then it comes back and we have a lady in our office named Anita and she makes magical things happen with it. I, I don't know what she does, but somehow she uses it to pay my insurance and do my maintenance and buy my tires. And that's the best thing is that we have administrative support. So I just go out and make the money and then I give it to them. And I, after that, they just make magic happen. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And would you mind going through some of the the instruction that you provide to the students? Is it exclusively focused on soil health and soil organisms, for example? You mentioned some water quality as well, but what do some of those lessons look like? So the lessons that we have in the soil trailer actually are everything. Um, I tell you what I'll do. I will go back to the slide showing the entire trailer so that we have a little more of a visual. Um, we're going to start with walking into, am I still screen sharing? Making sure, yes. So when the students walk into the back of the trailer, this is the side that we start on and we cover everything. This is six feet tall. It's actually seven, but we've got that foam in there. We start at peanuts and we cover everything all the way across. We cover the layers of the soil and we do explain to them, the soil trailer is larger than life. You're not gonna find a carrot growing into the fragipan. However, this is a unit for children. I have had adults come in and say, there's no such thing as a five foot carrot. And I'm like, yes, I know, but this is for visual purposes. <laughs> So we talk about every vegetable, we talk about what they find in the ceiling and about the topsoils, the layers of the soils. We stop usually right at fifth grade. So ours is very basic in general, but the students are able to touch and feel everything, just not during COVID. Um, we do have some artifacts. We have these microbes that they learn about, um, the animals, and then, we go over from there, well, come on back. It just jumped right over. We go over from there onto the water wall and usually I stand right here and I'll put both hands out and I'll say, hey, where would you like to go swimming? 
over here or over here. And usually the students will pick the clean side, but there's occasionally that one kid that's real adventurous and wants to go over and, and wants to get into the, um, the nasty water. But I'm like, okay, so here's the thing, you know, when we pollute, that affects our aquatic life, that affects our water quality, that affects our drinking water, that affects our environment. And we move all the way around the soil trailer and we also talk about in here, um, we have some mussels and, you know, we have our water and our ducks and our fish. And, and you can see there, there's a tire floating. Um, we talk about all of that. And then we come around to this wall and we discuss everything that we find, the ants, the insects, the larvae, um, all of the microbes and the different layers you can see here of the soil, because you can dig in one spot, and then you can move over four feet and dig in another spot and you may find different layers depending on how much that earth has been disturbed or moved and that's something that we also talk about and being in west virginia we are in coal country we also have our coal seam that we discuss um, but as we go through we talk about everything a soil trailer presentation takes about 40 minutes to do so it's it, it covers a lot. Um, and then we will talk about what we see on the ceiling last. Then we have question and answer. Each student gets to ask two questions to be answered. If we have older kids that we need to see, sometimes we'll tear these placards off, give them to three to four students in a group and say, learn everything you can about this in two hours, then come outside, you're gonna teach third grade. Gives them something to do and keeps them busy, keeps them out of trouble. And, helps me at the same time that I might be able to take lunch that day. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so Chris from Kansas, I believe, um, is very inspired that you are inspired by their, their trailer. So thank you for that. And he's asking as well, if you have a total estimate for uh, of costs, time, materials, et cetera, for the second build that you're planning. Time-wise, we're not 100% sure. Um, materials are actually really inexpensive. Um, once you take the trailer itself out of the equation, which we're looking at spending between twelve and 15000 this year, materials themselves are only around $5,000. But that doesn't include tools. Tools are a little more permanent, and tools can be anywhere from Two hundred and fifty to fifteen thousand. Uh, I am going to use better tools this time. We're able to purchase um, a saw table, a hot saw table, which is just basically a larger hot wire that's on a table stand. So I'm not using just a hot knife. We were able to get more hot wire. I'll have help. We have an intern this year, and she signed on as well. That's Reagan. Um, we're going to have help. She's going to be building it with me, and so I expect. I expect it to take at least nine months simply because you can only work on it during good weather because you can't melt foam in the cold. You can't use hot tools in the cold and you also can't do it in extreme heat. You've got to have the right ventilation. So I'm setting my goal to be complete, 100% complete by September 22nd of next year. And our total budget is 25,000 and total budget with the trailer is going to be 35000 And that's going to be for a 24 to 26 foot trailer. Um, the soil trailer that I have now, if I just had to buy a trailer and materials and not count time, it would cost $12,500 to build it. But if you're paying an artist, you're looking at a whole lot more. But since I'm already on salary and I'm the artist, they, they're saving that expense. Excellent. Thank you. And you reminded uh, the audience as well at the beginning of the presentation of some of the funding sources that have been supportive of these efforts, too. So um, I would just like to reiterate again, if anyone missed the, the beginning of the presentation, we'll make sure to send this around so that uh, people can have those details as well of some potential avenues they might be able to look into. Uh, Laura has also asked as well, um, how, Amy, would you recommend a CD get started if they're interested in learning how to create an ADA compliant mobile exhibit? Uh, and where would one go to, uh, if they would like to learn their requirements? And I'll expand that question as well. If you, in general, have any recommendations for uh, CDs or others who may be looking to expand their programming to be more inclusive, even outside of mobile exhibits, if they don't have something like that. 
I think that the most important thing to remember is that when you're going to schools, there's always going to be children within those schools that are differently abled, and you need to be prepared for that. The number one inspiration that I had for building a completely ADA compliant unit is because my son throughout kindergarten and first grade was in a wheelchair. Um, he he just had to have surgery. He broke the growth plate in his leg and he ended up in a wheelchair because of that. And when one of the agriculture units came to his school, the wheelchair couldn't go in. So he had to just sit at a little table outside with a project. And I was like, oh man, that's a bummer. And then I thought, oh, you know, maybe they could build ramps or something. And the lady was like, well, no, the aisles are too narrow. And, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, well, I'll just make my own then. And, um, then when I saw Kansas's trailer, I was like, wait a minute, what a fabulous idea. So that's the thing to remember is find ways to not just accommodate, but to be inclusive. Just because you can accommodate them doesn't mean that they're singular. So when in the deaf world, we have the term where we point our finger straight out and then we take our right finger and take it all the way to the right while the left one stays in the center. And that's where we talk about um, not being inclusive. You know, you, you may be equal and you may look the same, but one's over here and the other's over here. So it's not inclusive. Find projects that students can do that are inclusive. And I am always willing to help folks. All they have to do is shoot me an email and say, this is what I'd like to do. How can I make it more inclusive? And my mind constantly I'm just that person my mind is constantly working on that on finding ways to do that so as far as inclusiveness I would say um, do a lot of googling do a lot of research sit down in a chair and think what can I do from here sit in your office chair that rolls around and see how many things you bump into get your fold-out table and see if your wheelchair fits underneath it you know try it see Go to parents, go to families who have children that are differently abled and ask them, how can I accommodate and include your child? And believe me, they know the answers and they're more than willing to talk to you about it. They're very grateful for that. Um, as far as being able to, you know, getting the, the braille placards and things like that, um, our prison industries here, that's one of the trainings that they have for our inmates is to learn to do braille type so we're able to order signage through our prison industries which is wonderful and I can read braille visually but I cannot read braille with my fingers so um, it's wonderful to have them to be able to do that for us and as far as learning sign language most schools will make you have an interpreter they'll have the interpreter there unless you're certified to be able to teach in sign language so it is out there. Those classes are out there. And if it's something folks are interested in, I say go for it because the deaf community is not going to look at you and just shrug you off and say, oh, I can't understand you. They're going to pay attention because they're grateful. Uh, as far as becoming more inclusive, building a soil trailer, contact me. I'm more than happy to help folks. We're going to host this workshop so that folks can get started. The first thing to do is find funding. You need to find funding for the trailer. The trailer needs to be specially built with those specifications. It's not much more expensive than buying a trailer basically off the rack, you know, if you want to call it that, or off the lot. Um, it's not that much more expensive. And finding the materials, and for those folks out there that have a little artsy, you know, curve to them, you can do it. And learning the hot tools is just practice. And there are, there are many the way that I found to do it with this foam can be done anywhere in the United States, anywhere. And if you can find an airbrush artist, go to your local high schools, go to your local colleges, look for art classrooms, because kids even in high school are talented eons past anything I could ever do. And the best thing about students is they have an open mind. They're not closed in that box like adults are. They have a completely open mind and let's just be honest with ourselves, unless any of you are under the age of 25, they're past you anyway. I mean, they're past us. We, we have our intern Reagan is on here and I can assure you she is well past me. She's been with us for one month and she's already taking on. She has her own programs going on. She doesn't even need me. You know, I just say, here's some tasks and then she just takes care of it. Go to your high schools. Let these kids work for you. They need summer jobs right now. They need jobs 
the pandemic has taken away a lot of the jobs that would normally be there for high schoolers. Give them jobs. Let them help you. They're, they're wonderful. Thank you for that, Amy, and for that reminder as well. You were really creative in how you uh, approached getting the work done on this trailer. We were chatting before about how your family was really involved, and I think that really speaks volumes to how you were able to make this happen, just being passionate about it, seeing your vision, and, and carrying it through. And on that note as well, I believe one of your other colleagues, Davin, had noted that you had a, a very high impact at the State Fair in 2019, and he was curious if you could talk a little bit more about that and some of the audience that, that you saw there? Sure. So each year we visit, um, there are times that I'll visit three to four schools in a week. And when you look at three to four schools in a week and you're doing first grade or second grade through fifth grade, you're looking at upwards of 300 students per school, sometimes more. And those numbers do add up. But when we go to the West Virginia State Fair, we're looking at thousands and thousands of participants. And we just kind of keep a clicker to, to remember or we'll pass out a bookmark to every single person that comes into the soil trailer and visits with us at the soil trailer and that keeps lets us keep our data and on average we'll see anywhere from nine to twelve thousand people at the West Virginia State Fair that come through the soil trailer and the state fair is why I'm booked two years in advance because there's a lot of teachers that come to the state fair with their families and they're like hey I need you at my school and so we we are able to keep those numbers by giving out those bookmarks and then we count how many we have at the end um, the numbers are huge for there and that's all impact because they come through they get the trailer tour they get an understanding and oftentimes it leads to master gardeners wanting to volunteer teachers wanting to book companies who are interested environmental companies who are interested in sponsoring schools in their area they'll say oh we, there's a school in our area there's there's this school that that could really use this and so the state fairs are a wonderful resource and one of the one of my favorite things about the state fair is that I get there at 7 a.m even though we don't open up until nine because there's a huge carnival at the state fair on the other side of the fairgrounds and the children that are there with the carnival employees that are staying in the campground will gather and come to my soil trailer at eight o'clock in the morning when their parents come in to work. And we actually have science class and they they do this every year. They come to see Miss Amy and they have science class every single year and we'll do a hands on project at the tables it's like I'm hosting class and they'll bring their breakfast with them and they'll bring me drinks they'll bring me cotton candy. <laughs> I let's just be honest I'm in it for the cotton candy and you know but it's really fabulous and and yeah the numbers bounce anywhere from nine to twelve thousand and we're a tiny state we're a very tiny state so I can only imagine what the numbers would be with other states what the impact would be Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and we have a, a question as well. If you wouldn't mind going into detail on some of the, the programs that you do outside of the trailer, some of the educational programs. So we have one of our old standbys, which is habitats, because it's easy to travel with. And that's where we have plastic bugs and insects. Um, we might have a cow, we might have a turkey, we might have an aphid. It just depends. The kids line up at that table. They get what they get bug wise. There's no guessing. They don't get to pick. They might get a spider. They might get a snake. They might also get a turtle, but they might get a horse. We have materials on the table that they can choose from to build a habitat for that particular animal. At the end of that little workshop, which they're timed, they only have five minutes to find the proper materials to build the habitat for these animals or insects. And at the end, they get to tell their classroom what their habitat is, why their habitat's there. And, and I learned so much during this because we had little plastic Easter eggs as part of the build. And I'm thinking, you know, they can put like a turkey in an Easter egg or something and say, hey, this is its habitat before it was hatched or whatever. But instead they'll like take the Easter egg and put it in their snake pit. And I'm like, well, what's that in there for? And they're like, well, that's dinner, you know? and um, one little boy, I take limbs and I slice them 
into what we call tree cookies. And those are in there as part of habitat materials. And one little boy just had his tray and he just filled it with those little tree slices. And I'm like, what are you doing? Where's your habitat? And he said, I ain't got one. I said, well, why not? And he said, I logged it. I was like, you know what? what do you mean you logged it <laughs> he really didn't want to play habitat so he just logged his entire habitat i was like okay well touche buddy um i got you but that's a, a really fun one um we also do rock inspections we have magnifying glasses and rocks out with sand um there are so many we have paper pot making we do seed planting we make seed paper um we'll actually blend up the pulp and like let the kids make um, seed paper in cookie cutters, things like that. There's there's a myriad of them, but they have to be 10 minutes to 15 minutes each. So um, I do have a list of them somewhere. It's been a year now since I traveled or had communications with other humans other than these screens. So if someone wants to email me, I can give them the full list as well as the curriculum design. We have design templates. Um, and in fact, if you guys want to bear with me for me to pull it up, I know we only have a couple minutes, but this may very well be worth pulling up um, for me to help folks get a visual of how our, um, I don't know why this thing doesn't want to open up over there, but it'll, it can give a visual of how we actually do the templates. Um, I just have to close some of these other ones out. And I'll share it with it. I can go straight in and then I can share it on the screen. Um, it's all pulling up. So I call them project design templates, which of course is the new, um, that's the new terminology for lesson plans in our region. So I'm going to send it over and we have these designs approved through the West Virginia State Board of Education. Um, so that's actually pretty handy and I'm going to move this over into here. So this is a project template design. Um, it gets approved by it goes through two college professors and then it goes to the State Board of Education and gets approved. So we have our components. Of course, we have the project name, project time, project idea, identified learning targets, components and here's our five components for education it even gives scoring you know are you getting a three out of five five out of five um the movement you want to know how many times you're moving occupational if you need a modification for students who are differently abled it's tactile ada compliant and the materials that are needed um, Amy, um yes quickly, i don't think we're seeing the screen actually uh, oh, oh no it says that it's sharing still Stop sharing your uh, PowerPoint, perhaps. Um, just I can do that. that out, and then you can reshare with the. How about that? Now we are just seeing the audience. So go ahead and try to reshare hmm. with the the document. Okay, let's try this. There we go. How about that? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so we'll just go back over this is it looks very basic. Um, but this is how it's written up and I'm more than happy to send these to anyone that would like them. Um, we put our CSOs, which is our standard objectives, then we have next gen, which is basically um, common core. And then we have the driving questions that are very important to ask for lesson plans, you know, what is your output your objective, your end result that you want to learn. Um, the performance objectives, this is what we want the children to be able to say and do at the end of it. And then we also have the rubrics and the reflections and then the animals that we may give them. And then I also add additional photos to give teachers an idea of what we're going to be giving the kids. This one in particular is a favorite. Um, we were at a camp, so we went with natural materials we found in the camp, and they built log cabins with sticks. You can't beat that. That was actually really fun. So this is what we send out to the teachers before the soil trailer visits so that they know what they're getting. And they're able to, sometimes teachers will say, well, I can't do it because I have specials at that time or we're in second period and we're in science. And I can say, well, here's the content standards that I have. Tell me what your standard objective is that day, and I'll match it to the projects that I have. 
So we have several different projects. Um, we have some that are, if we're on a riverbank, we have some for water, we have them for soil, we have them for everything. Perfect. And we are wrapping up shortly here, but I want to address two final uh, questions from the audience. One is, how many people do you need to do a presentation uh, for the day? How many instructors, uh, outreach specialists, et cetera? And then what are the estimated annual costs for the program, including insurance, staff time, learning materials, et cetera? So these are two great questions. Um, me is the answer to number one. I travel alone, I present alone, I sit up alone. Every now and then I get lucky and folks will show up to help me, um, but I do it alone, 100% alone. And it's not always easy. So we ask for the schools to have parent volunteers and I do a quick five minute with the parent volunteers and oftentimes they are absolutely wonderful. Um, otherwise, our other employees are so busy that they're just not able to follow around and help me. So it's me. Um, secondly, we're actually extremely inexpensive because our revenue covers so much. Um, it costs, because everything's reimbursed, every bit of mileage is reimbursed. And then the revenue comes in from the trailer itself. Insurance, we're covered under BRIM. I have no idea of knowing what the insurance is on the trailer, but I'm pretty sure it's like $200 a year something extremely inexpensive because our state has thousands of vehicles covered under BRIM insurance. So it's actually extremely cheap. The difference with the insurance is we don't just have a policy on the unit. We have a policy on the art inside. We actually have a museum policy. And that was something that I learned from the Kansas folks. Um, they're the ones that taught me that to have the museum policy on the artwork inside. So that's a little bit extra, but it may be a, again, another couple hundred dollars. Um, so the revenue more than covers, and I'm actually usually in the clear anywhere from sixteen to twenty thousand dollars on a regular busy year. Um, we have not gone in the red yet. If you count my um, salary, I don't know where we're at. That is the magical things that Anita and Jennifer, my supervisor, and Angie take care of, and they just send me out to to do the work and they just take care of everything else. And I'm very lucky in that sense. Um, in the beginning, I didn't have that. I was three years, yeah, three years on my own with it. And our revenue was around $9,000 a year at that time after all costs. So we, we never went in debt with it. That's really helpful information, Amy. And with that, um, we did ask, uh, we did have another attendee ask if you would share those templates too. So if you could make sure to have those uh, sent over to me, I can share them out with the group. And then for our audience as well, I'll make sure that you have the uh, recording for today and Amy's contact information because I'm sure all of you will have plenty more questions for her as you get going. So thank you again, Amy, for this truly inspiring and very detailed presentation. I definitely learned a lot. So um, please, audience, if you have any other additional questions or comments or recommendations for future webinars, uh, you'll have my email as well and feel free to reach out at any time. With that, thank you so much for joining us this morning and have a great day.